Well, the haters gonna hate, 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 and the fakers gonna fake, 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 baby. I'm just gonna make, 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 making luck, making luck. A Dimity Podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome back for another episode of Making Luck, a Dominion Podcast. My name is Adam, and here with me, as usual, is Jake. Hi, Jake. Hey, Adam. How are you doing today? I'm doing okay. I had a halfway decent weekend. All right. Those are the best ones, the halfway decent ones. <laughs> Could have been much worse. Those are, that's as good as they get. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at this point in my life, I couldn't possibly ask for anything more. <laughs> no. Oh, well, actually, you're about to have kids, too, so that's going to get even more true. What? <laughs> oh, have you not had this conversation? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, hey, the, Adam, the wife, you? the wife and I are trying, but there's no news on that front. Yeah, no, not at all. Oh, am I supposed to like enjoy every minute of my life until, uh, until you, the kids ruin it? Or like, yeah, you've got. I mean, a year from now, when this, <laughs> and then you have 18 years of, ah, and then <laughs> you're gonna get back to this eventually. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I think what's going to happen is if we're still uh, doing this podcast in a year and uh, my my wife has a kid, <laughs> then you can just expect the podcast to continue, but there will be crying in the background, so I hope you like that. Yes, and maybe we'll raffle off the baby at some point. Speaking mm. of the raffle, <laughs> okay. I, we do want to talk first about who won the raffle. Oh, That'll yeah. be... Gregory Gregstone, and I do want to congratulate you. We had some leftovers, like I said, and the lucky winner of the raffle got to have some. I hope you enjoyed them. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little jealous. I actually entered the raffle this time because I was hungry, and I did not win, so I'm no, a little salty. No, Gregory. Yeah. Stupid Gregory. But the winner of this raffle is actually going to get a very special prize. Whoever wins is going oh. to get what to set what my Skype password is for the next four months. You'll know what my Skype password is because you got to set it. That's going to be your pride. Adam is sexy, 101, 101. Hey, you haven't won this raffle yet, Adam. What? Whoever wins it. There's there's my yep. official recommendation. Yep, you're going to get to uh, set yeah. my password. Yeah, I'm okay. trying that in two weeks. I'm trying that <laughs> password. We're going to see. All right, so... As always, we do want to start out by letting you know what we're going to talk about today. We thought it would be good to get into the cards Mint and Farmland yeah. because those are two cards that in some ways have some similar functions on a lot of boards. And also they are cards that I think we both think are kind of misused and underutilized by the community. So I'm going to get into uh... this. If that's an inclusive or, then yes. Misused yeah. or yeah. underutilized. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one for each of them. But which one is which? Find out next time on Making Luck. A Dominion Pug. Anyway. Uh, so we had a, I need we had a, carbs, Adam. We need a, yeah, we had, we had a kingdom last time, and it was, it was fluffy and, uh, wait, it was white bread. Yeah, it was disgusting, yeah. but it was something. Uh, do you want to read the cards to us, Jake? Yeah, so the kingdom we playtested last time and gave our thoughts on consisted of the following cards. We started with City Quarter, Catapult, which is again split with rocks, Farmer's Market, Caravan, Wild Hunt, Bridge Troll, Charm, Haggler, Mandarin, Replace, and then we had two events, Bonfire and Raid. Once more for our audio-only listeners, we had City Quarter, Catapult, Farmer's Market, Caravan, Wild Hunt, Bridge Troll, Charm, Haggler, Mandarin, replace with bonfire and raid and another reminder that the catapult pile has five catapults and underneath that five rocks all right so you had thought that the opener was the optimal opener was going to be bonfire and maybe catapult or something yeah right? catapult bonfire i said 
I disagreed. I thought the best opener was going to be Caravan Catapult. Yep. I, I think We'd both like of us were times. pretty far wrong, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it was pretty bad. I mean, I I can I still would maybe open Caravan Catapult. I mean, that's I, that's better than the bonfire. I'll give you that. Yeah, the bonfire <laughs> did wonders. Until, it was like, real bad. <laughs> turn like five, bonfire starts being pretty good. I I, I don't even know about that. I mean, bonfire. <laughs> see, like I just. I really misread this one because, like, the the problem is that City Quarter costs eight debt. Yeah. And if you play a bridge troll, it does not reduce the cost. And you no. can't do anything here without City Quarter. Yeah. The strategic paradigm of this board really seemed to revolve around when you started buying sil- City Quarters and how you had planned to pay off the debt of them because i think that's, you know you agree you, you need them that like, yeah nothing you can do that and that's that's them. hard i mean you can't play big money here you're getting bridge trolled you're getting catapulted you're getting junked i mean big money is it's just going to fail and die it's also just going to get even if you weren't getting attacked at all big money is just going to f- way fall behind to bridge trolls or wild hunts Right, there's there's a ton of points that, that you can score and, and big money can get shut down. So like you can't yeah. do that. You have to play a higher payload deck. You have to get control over your deck and, and do stuff and become resilient to the attacks. And uh, you know, city quarter is necessary for that. All the cool stuff yeah. you want to do is terminal. Definitely. But there's no real way to be paying off that deck in a consistent and efficient way. Yeah, to there's... be getting those mid-game city quarters like you want, so you kind of just need here, I think, to accept the fact that you're going to have some terminal collision and try to play your hand the best that you can, and just clench and buy the city quarters later. Yeah, like if you want to make real money to pay off that real debt, then you have options, and the options are either terminal actions or treasure cards, and and each one of those is bad because you can only play so many terminals. Because you need city quarters to play the terminals, right? And and the treasures right. are not good for drawing cards with the city quarters. So uh, I thought that, you know, you wanted the action-dense deck, and that would be good. And man, that deck is bad. Like, if you bonfire down and get a really action-dense deck, yeah, you can draw a lot. But you're just not doing anything. And if you want to build from there, it takes so, so, so long. It's just It's just real bad. It doesn't work at all. And I think what we decided is that the correct approach or the best approach, the one that gets to where it needs to get the fastest, is the one that kind of does things in a hybrid way. Kind of starts out by shoving some caravans in and getting a bridge troll every now and then and uses farmer's market for mid-game payload, but then eventually oh, yeah. gets the city quarters. I yeah, said farmer's, farmer's market. market was bad. Remember when I said that? Yeah, oh, it's it like out. solidly mediocre here. It wasn't bad at all. <laughs> like I found, I found time for yeah. one or two of them in pretty much every deck that I deemed to be good that I built with this kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Farmer's market wasn't a strategy here. Like you weren't factoring those four point chips or getting that money into like your strategy for how you're going to win the game. But as far as mid game building, it was very solid. It competed for terminal space with Wild Hunt and Bridge Troll, but it also helped you pay off debt so that you can play Wild Hunts and Bridge Trolls. So eventually you trash it to get the points and your deck is no worse for it. Yeah, it was really, it was, it was a lot better than I thought. And it, it actually reminded me of when I previewed the card. And I said, Farmer's Market synergizes with other terminal payload cards. And like, yeah. that actually happened here. And it doesn't, I mean, Farmer's Market's not great all that often, but, like, it actually fit that role here. And and that's something that, I mean, Farmer's Market being good is something you don't see very often. Yeah. You know, it happened here. I I should add, you mentioned mentioned Caravan here. And yeah, I I think, you know, the best deck uses City Quarter for draw, along with maybe some other stuff. But it has mostly Treasures as, as your payload. Like, Treasures are a big part of the deck. 
And so if you want that deck to be reliable in any way, Caravan is an extremely important card. Especially if you're going to get Catapult attacked, there's that interaction between Caravan and the Catapult attack to to maybe kind of save your business. So it becomes very important very quickly to just shove as many Caravans in the deck as you possibly can and just get all of the Caravans. Yeah, and we mentioned before that it's pretty obvious that the best deck here utilizes City Quarter for draw and then plays those very strong terminals, Bridge Trolls and Wild Hunts. But we also mentioned that getting there is very tricky because there isn't a lot of way to get money to pay off the City Quarter debt. Um, Caravan then becomes extremely important in the mid-game to keep your deck viable and keep yourself moving through it so that you don't have dud turns. And you need that draw in the in the middle while you're getting your city quarters online, so to speak. Losing right. a caravan split here seven to three is pretty bad. Losing it six four is not the end of the world. But if your opponent it's, gets seven, uh, kind of sad. Having six caravans is really nice, though. It really is. It just yeah. brings the chance of bad things happening to you down so much. Yeah. So yeah, I think we decided that in your opener you probably are picking up a caravan maybe uh and you're probably I like, picking well, i like a catapult silver opening and then yeah. i'm probably getting like a replace and then uh just shoving the caravans in the deck until they're gone and then i start thinking about other stuff usually by then i'm drawing quite a bit i'm getting one or two maybe even three silvers along yeah. the way I don't think either of us were terribly impressed with the performance of Haggler or Replace when we focused on them. Haggler especially forced you to gain coppers with your city quarters. That wasn't good, so yeah. eventually you kind of just wanted to trash it. Yeah, Replace I... was okay for a mid-game buy, especially if you find yourself in debt with no way to play it off. Replace can kind of be your get-out-of-jail-free card by keeping your payload increasing even despite that but sure i think haggler's outclassed by charm here i know it's not an action card but charm just kind of <clears throat> does the job better than haggler does and you know city quarter has a yeah. bit to do with it replace i think is mostly good for shoving caravans in the deck but uh you know you kind of have this mix of wild hunt and bridge troll as your payload and uh with bridge trolls out replace can do some pretty nice things i found myself happy to replace a copper with a silver draw it so that I could gain more silvers with Raid, because Raid was, like, actually good. It yeah. Was actually good for adding payload to the deck once I was drawing a whole bunch. Yeah, and that's key here, is that Raid was only good once you consistently had your deck in your hand every turn and had more draw after that. Yeah, you could, like, reasonably get a City Quarter and maybe something else each turn. So, like, right. once you could raid and get a City Quarter, you were in pretty good shape, assuming you had enough caravans out to make sure your next hand didn't suck. And the two schools of thought as far as how you actually win the game on this board were between Bridge Troll and Wild Hunt. And where uh, we initially discussed whether or not you could ignore Wild Hunt here and just focus on the Bridge Troll Mega Turn. Normally, if you hear the phrase, ignore Wild Hunt... You're talking about somebody who lost the game. But here, <laughs> it was actually kind of fine because Bridge Troll was so explosive once it's enabled with those city quarters that it kind of doesn't matter. If you had that Bridge Troll mega turn and your opponent got like 10 wild hunt points, whatever, I'm emptying provinces. Actually, in our case, it was estates, but whatever. <laughs> um, you get the idea. Sure. I think... Uh... It could have been duchies. I didn't, I didn't, yeah, I didn't score many points with Wild Hunt this game, and I think that had a lot to do with the fact that it was a mirror. I mean, Wild Hunt is more points, so if, if someone else is not going for piles and you have most of the pile control, Wild Hunt can get a lot better. It also gives you control over the estate pile, so I could see it being better then, but in a mirror, Bridge Troll's going to be doing a lot more work for you. It takes up half the terminal space, and uh, it gives you a lot of gains, and it has great synergy with Charm. And, you know, you want to you wanna have Wild Hunts in the deck because having the draw can be nice in certain situations when you feel like, oh, I need some more draw. Maybe I don't have as many caravans out. You know, I can replace into a Wild Hunt and stick it on top for next turn. Something like yeah. that. That can be useful wild... to have the Wild Hunts in your deck. Normally, Wild Hunt is good enough that it can be a strategy. It can be your focus for the game. But... 
bridge, but in this game, it felt more of a tactical play. Mm-hmm. Like, it felt like, okay, getting a wild hunt and playing it now is a good call, as opposed to this game I'm getting and playing wild hunts. Yeah. I didn't really expect the board to play out the way it did. Uh, I, I misread this one pretty hard. So uh, I, I would have gotten d- destroyed. Like, a bonfire opening just sets you so far back. If I opened bonfire here, I would have just lost pretty much no matter what. No bueno. Yeah, and you definitely cannot lose the Mandarin split. <laughs> yeah, it's critical, man. <laughs> That's Got a joke. It. Neither of us bought a Mandarin at any point. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah, The one other interesting point I think I want to make here is that a lot of the time we talk about orange cards, them being orange, being a cost for this really powerful effect that they give you, and like you don't want them to be orange because... Um, means they miss the shuffle all the time what you said was interesting about bridge troll taking up half the terminal space is yeah. definitely something that plays out here and for sure gives, yeah it gives bridge troll a serious benefit in the form of not because that terminal space is so hard to free up with city quarter being the only uh, source of plus action so bridge trolls orangeness ended up being a benefit not a cost yeah, I mean, when terminal space is tight, the, the terminal orange cards are going to be that way. Uh, the cost of orange cards uh, is a lot with the opener. The, the cost is more pronounced in the opening, which is why I don't like opening with orange cards, but, you know, we've, we've talked about that. And, right. You know. Anyway, uh, that's, that's yeah. about all I had to say about this kingdom. Yeah, let us know if you think we missed something. If you have played this board by yourself, it's a fun board to play, so feel free to bring it out with your friends. Or if you would do something completely different, let us know about that. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, So do you know what my favorite kind of lunch meat is, Jake? It's the kind of lunch meat that when you buy it, there's some benefit to having put it into your household. Uh, yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, I was also thinking like minty lunch meat. Oh, my, yeah. my favorite oh, kind of, my favorite kind of lunch meat is, <laughs> uh, spearmint lunch meat. Spearmint lunch meat. Yeah. Is that a, that feels like a Kroger thing. It's gotta be a Kroger <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> so I realize, uh, I mean, Kroger may be a, a Midwest thing, but that same chain exists with a lot of different names. Oh, yeah. In other parts of the country, I think there's like a pay less, and then there's a oh man, what's it called out in California? I visited there. Giant but, uh, Eagle? Are they a Giant Eagle place? No, uh, Giant Eagle's a different play, a uh, different chain. They're owned by Kroger. Oh, are they? Actually, by by the way, even if you don't have Kroger, uh, the Kroger company does own whatever you do have. Yeah, FYI. I think I think that's true, and and they they probably have that spearmint lunch meat in there. Give it a shot; it's quite good. Uh, yeah, great with Adam, lamb. Adam. Yeah, it goes really great with uh, Dominion too. Yeah, uh, Mint is a is a Dominion card. As yes, well as a delicious lunch meat. Yeah, speaking of Mint, that's a card we're talking about today. Yeah, uh, how about I read the text of that bad boy? Sounds so good. It's a, it's a five-cost action. That's from the Prosperity expansion, and it says you may reveal a treasure from your hand, gain a copy of it. And then it also says when you buy this, trash all treasures you have in play. So uh, there's there's two functions of this card, right? Uh, there's the, the on-gain effect when you trash your treasures, and then when you play it, you get to copy treasures. Uh, so, you know, if, you, if you're going to trash treasures, uh, you probably want to be trashing coppers with it. Uh, trashing anything else usually feels pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, normally, if you're going to be trashing a lot of coppers and buying a fiver, uh, you, you probably need to draw some cards. Uh, it's going to be tough to put five coppers together or maybe even more coppers uh, unless you're drawing some cards. So uh, right. there's, there's synergy there between draw and any on-gain effective mint. Uh and then there's the other mode that's like, oh, what do you want to be copying? Uh, well, obviously, platinum is probably the best thing, uh, but golds are usually pretty happy. And uh, you're usually happy to, to uh, mint stuff like crown or plunder, or idol, even horn of plenty. Uh, those, are, those are pretty good things to be minting. Uh, 
Uh, the idea is that uh, silver is not really the best thing to mint. I mean, it's fine, but uh, it's not it's not super sexy. Like, there's Explorer that gains you the silver to hand, and so mint is just worse in, in that regard. And also, like, trashing yeah. mint to the to gaining, or trashing silver to mint gain is uh, not all that sexy. So uh, that's kind of a baseline for what I like to expect from if mint. You're... If you're playing a terminal action to gain a silver, you definitely need to have some other benefit to that. Yeah, at least Bureaucrat attacks your opponent and top decks the silver. Come on, <laughs> you slacker. Yeah. Get to work, bucko. Yeah. So a lot of the time, the on-gain effect of Mint is something that stands out to people. Definitely a lot more than the effect that happens when you play it. And in my oh, mind, yeah. rightfully so, because that's kind of the most significant part of the card on most boards. And a lot of the time you are looking to set up a mid-game mint buy or a big turn where you play a bunch of coppers and trash them all to mint. Because that is a really strong form of deck control, even if it didn't happen immediately. Like Adam said, you really need to be drawing cards to make that good because <laughs> you're n okay. Maybe you're that guy, all right? Maybe you're <laughs> that guy who turn three just happens to draw five coppers and he stares at the board for me. He's like, oh, I guess I'll buy a mint and trash five coppers and have these other two cards that I buy. He opened and for I model silver. God, I yeah, that. screw that guy. <laughs> <sighs> but let's be real, you're not that guy. Uh, and <laughs> I've never no. that guy. No, I'm never that guy either. I, and I opened Nomad Camp Double Lighthouse, and it was a tournament board, and it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So to set up that big mid turn where you trash five or more coppers to it, like Adam said, you're going to need to be drawing cards and. Opening with a terminal in that case that draws cards is totally fine. Adam has talked before about how when you look at the control options for your deck and you see that they're very expensive, opening with payload to help you hit those price points is as top a priority as controlling your deck itself. Yeah, so like the, the dream there, you know, you open Remodel Silver and then you wake up on turn three with five coppers. That's super great. A lot of times that's so good that it's hard to catch up to you. You're, you're going to have a great advantage because you have this immediate yeah. deck control. You're able to play your Remodel frequently. You're able to start gaining great cards pretty much immediately. Sure. And, and the Mint is going to be good as well not too long. And if it's not, you just Remodel it. It's fine, right? Without drawing cards, yeah, that's going to be tough to do. And so, you know, you want to draw cards to give yourself the chance of that. But, you know, make sure – a lot of times, you know, you don't want to go all in on it, right? But giving no. yourself the chance to high roll and have something great happen to you is often pretty good. And that normally means, you know, getting some draw, but also having something in your deck, something that generates economy for you uh, before you get the mint. Right. You don't want to put yourself in a position where you've trashed all of your payload and near the end of this mint discussion, we're going to get into mint openers. Oh, boy. And uh, Adam has written a whole article on them, but we'll, we'll address that too. So drawing is the best way to do it. And again, because it happens in your buy phase, you don't care if the draw is terminal. So, you know smithy can set up a really good mid turn just as well as anything else can yeah smithy's pretty good i i find that a lot of those one shot draws so like expedition or even tactician yeah. like those those are pretty uh reliable ways expedition plus a little bit of deck tracking or even stuff like save and haven saving if you will saving yeah that's actually i consider that a different kind of benefit but seeding your next hand is something to look for too is a really great enabler to mint yeah in, in the right situation these things can uh you know just think about what's coming up and if you can set this kind of thing up you know you, you obviously want to do it yeah i, I gear. think oh gear yeah oh yeah. man gear is such a good card yeah so the other way to do it and you're less happy about this but if you've decided that Mint is the only way you're going to be controlling your deck in terms of thinning it. You could put more money in your deck to help you hit five and be able to trash the treasures. 
the drawback there is that if you're not playing five coppers, you're not trashing five coppers. So, and you also have to trash, you know, the silver or whatever it is that you played to hit five. Yeah. So that feels a little worse if you yeah. have to do it that way. So in the absence of draw, a lot of times you find yourself doing this and then maybe even minting twice if getting rid of the coppers is that important. Just like get three of them out of the way, get three of them out of the way next turn, and, and maybe a silver has to go down. But, you know, a, a terminal silver that you don't have to trash can be nice. So something like Swindler uh, gives you the $2 yeah. and it stays around. Uh, but, you know, stuff like Fishing Village and Lighthouse, the duration money can be helpful there, help you trash maybe four coppers. Uh, it's not as good as five, obviously, because yeah. four is less than five. I don't, I don't the, know if you knew that. That's true. It's a thing that a lot of people forget about Dominion a lot yeah. of the time is how to count to ten. It's hard. But, yeah. <laughs> and it's not that there's a problem with getting your money from actions when you're going for mint. There's no problem with that. It doesn't make mint worse. It's just that gaining it isn't as good if all the money isn't coming from the five coppers you wanted to trash. That's true. That doesn't make it harder to do. It just makes it less of a consideration as to whether you're going for mint in the first place. Yeah, that, that on-gain benefit, I'm putting benefit in quotation marks, we assume you want it. That on-gain benefit is <laughs> is really sexy when you're trashing five cop five or more coppers to it. It's kind of okay when you trash four, but like when you're trashing three, eh, it leaves me wanting more. It leaves me wanting more of that delicious minty lunch meat. And here's the other problem with it. And in my mind, mint can function as two different cards depending on what the kingdom looks like. There is the mint that you buy for its effect because you intend to play it and gain treasures off of it. And then there's what mint is most of the time for me, which is something I buy because I'm changing ten, five dead-ish cards, five or more, <laughs> which are coppers. Because, like, coppers aren't great. I want them out of my deck. And I'm taking those five slots out and taking one dead card because I never intend to play them yet. All right, all right, Speedy. But I'm making my dent more consistent, cool. and that's how I usually play mint. And if I'm not trashing five cards to do that, all right, it makes that exchange much worse. All right, Sparky. Adam has opinion. Calm, calm <laughs> down there. Let's just I will let's just take down. our let's take our foot off the accelerator for just a second, okay? Uh -uh. Uh, mint is not a bad card, and 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 the the effect is actually I think it's especially good in decks that just thinned five coppers because if you have something good to mint and you manage to draw those five coppers uh then either one you were really lucky and you probably want a gold flood because uh you're just going to win the game or number two you have all this overdraw now because you're not you don't have these coppers anymore what do you need you need payload hey guess what the mint does it gains you payload like there it's actually it actually has synergy and i think even on big money boards without colonies like if you can mint like gold flooding is, is quite good it really speeds you up so like let's let's not discount mints on play effect because it's it's not the sexiest thing in the world like your deck is is prime for just like shoving great treasures into it and mint's good at that no, it's not totally useless. And when I say it's a dead card, <laughs> when I say it's a dead card, it's not I mean totally that useless. When, <laughs> when I say it's a dead card, I mean that usually in the deck that I'm putting mint into, I mean I'm probably not doing it in a big money deck, and I probably have another terminal I'd rather play. Even oh, if I'm just man. playing the mint to gain a silver. I mean, even if I'm gaining, I'm sorry, even if I'm playing the mint to gain like a really sexy treasure, like oh, that a delicious relic gold or a gold. Oh, yeah. If I if it was a deck that I was incentivized to put mint into in the first place, I ha probably have another terminal I'd rather play in instead. I'm not going to usually why? decline to play the mint over nothing. I, but... I don't I don't say wait, wait what, what does that have to do with anything? Like why why are decks that you want mint in strapped for terminal space? I don't I don't see any reason why that has to be the case. Well, I don't see mint being that good in a big money deck, so a lot of the time mint is probably something I'm putting into a deck that's chaining actions together and that probably ends in a really powerful stop card probably something better than mint 
Okay. Uh, first of all, if you can actually pull off mint and big money, it's quite good. Now, it's it's hard, right? And and sometimes it just doesn't work out. Sometimes you don't want to build. To, I, I understand that. But like, once once mint is in that big money deck, the effect is quite good. Sure. So but so now like the said, getting there's a long shot. Uh, a lot of times, yeah. Without support, uh, you kind of have to get lucky. So so that's you know that's. Whenever it happens, yeah, mint is great when you get it in the deck. But man. so, but but then uh, you know you have all these these chaining action cards, and you have all these great stop cards that you supposedly want to play, right? Now yeah. sometimes, sometimes yellow equals purple, and all you want to do is thin those coppers. Uh, and it's, I feel like this is a very professional podcast because everyone just heard my phone went off. So um, <laughs> just, just thought you'd all like to know that. I'm not going to okay. edit you that caught out. Me, you caught me chewing on VP tokens last podcast, so <laughs> I think we're, we've are we set a standard. Oh, and remember what you were doing to the microphone that I edited out? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I got a new headset, and I was, like, chewing on my microphone. Because that's what I do, apparently, when I have things that I don't understand. I put them in my mouth. It was really loud. Yeah, well, it's because the microphone was in my mouth. All the noises of my body, you heard. It was it was really something I gotta tell you. Yeah. Speaking anyway, the noises your body makes when you buy mint. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what I'm what I'm saying is that like a lot of times mint is not that bad, and like silver and gold are not terrible cards for high payload decks. Not all the time. Yeah. Well, where mint really shines, like you said, is copying those really cool kingdom treasures most of the time. Feels I mean, good. okay. So playing a mint to gain a copper is not something you would do most of the time. Uh, playing uh, a mint to gain a silver is something you might do over nothing, but you're not happy about it. Playing the mint to gain a gold is strictly Complete worse than... Complete success. Soothsayer, but Soothsayer isn't on every board, so I guess you're okay with it. <laughs> playing a mint to gain a platinum, now we're now we're getting somewhere. That's... A card I would pay five for. Wow, you're stingy, man. Now, but we get into where Mint is really in its shining comfort zone, and that's where we're playing it to gain these kingdom-specific treasures that we've already decided that we wanted. I mean, I feel like gold fits into that list. I think gold's on the same level, and platinum is a step above all of it. I'll take a gold. I mean... It's fine. But yeah, sure, you're very happy to gain those those yeah. fancy cards like Crown and stuff. You're very happy. Yeah, Crown. Uh, even ill gotten gains in a lot of cases. Uh, okay. I think. Yeah. You know, sure. If you if you have an ill gotten gains and you have the maybe that even ends up with you buying another mint to trash all these ill gotten gains that are in your deck if you get to play mint as an attack. Like that's kind of neat. Uh I mean you probably want to be drawing a lot for that to be good, but yeah, sure. That's well, you want to be drawing a lot for the mint anyway. You'll notice a theme here, and that's that all these on-gain effects, really everything in Dominion, but especially these on-gain effects, require a lot of draw to maximize their potential. Drawing cards is really good. Yeah, in case there was any doubt. Yeah. Yeah, and on-gain effects actually don't even care if the draw is terminal, because nothing you need to do with the draw cares if you have actions left, so... Uh, sure. Let's just, I mean, I'm sure there's an edge case and I don't care about it. So, yeah. Yeah. So there's uh, there's one more thing that I think is pretty important to go with Mint. It was actually at the top of my list and it hasn't been said yet. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I think synergizes with Mint, both in setting it up and also uh, making the card good, is estate trashing. It's going to yeah. be a lot easier for me to hit five and line up my coppers if I don't have estates in the way. If yeah. I can trash those estates and gain draw cards or cantrips or, you know, whatever else. Or silvers that I can mint so I can buy a gold and mint that, you know. Uh, estate trashing is quite good, especially because, um, you know, you want to make sure that you have a decent deck once you have minted. And so if you mint too yeah. early, you risk uh, getting rid of a huge chunk of your economy in a large number of coppers. And you want to have something to soften the blow of that. Uh, and having no estates is a great start. 
Exactly. We talked a little bit in the last episode about the concept of tempo and how over trashing too early can kill your tempo. And what we mean by that is basically your deck's viability right here, right now to continue building and advancing yourself toward winning the game. And buying a mint is is great for tempo if it's thinning out coppers and you have other good stuff. But if you've left all those estates in and you haven't, you know, picked up that really great stuff, then consider the fact that of what's left in your deck, most of it is dead. Yes, yeah, it's, it's no bueno. And like this is this is exactly why trashing is good. Like we spent almost all of last podcast talking about that, right? I mean, these right. estates are so bad for setting up your mint. They're so bad for having a deck that's good for mint. And you're just gonna find this so often. Like estates are dumb. Let's get rid of them. Like this is why trashing is good. You know what I mean? Definitely. Yeah. So like, yeah. if I'm looking for the strongest synergies with mint overall, I'm looking for like combinations of these things i want estate trashing i want draw and i want uh you know manipulation deck manipulation that kind of thing so things at the top of the list i'm thinking uh, hermit with madman hermit trashes the estates madman's that one shot draw that helps make it all come together um yeah totally jack of all trades can be good uh it's, it's what was that jake sorry jake of all trades thank you uh, it can be good especially with shelters uh, because you can cycle past your necro, you can trash those shelters, you can trash with the the ogi to draw another card. It helps you get uh, five coppers together, maybe a little earlier. But still, jack of all trades. It it gives you some good cards in your deck that are not shelters, and it it does draw, draw up to five, which is not to be sneezed at. So there is some synergy there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, also, apprentice uh, trashes the states early, and then. Um, Apprentice likes expensive things, so you can mint golds just to apprentice them if you want to do that for draw. Uh, that's a thing you can do. So those, I would say those are probably among the better synergies for, for mint, but uh, gear is probably pretty good, too. You mentioned gear, and I didn't put that on my list, but uh, yeah, that's a, it's pretty good, too. Yeah, gear can gear is good for any aspect of a kingdom that rewards you for having one really big turn over several mediocre turns like gear is great for that yeah gear's great for a lot of things and that's one of them gear is such a good yeah. card yeah so we've gone into some of what the pitfalls of buying mint are and adam's gone over some of what the synergies are as well so what are what, what's one of the biggest problems with it? I got to tell you. In the way that people utilize it. There are so many people that look at a 5-2 and they see Mint and they're like, yes, I win the game. And they open Mint <laughs> Popper. I'm not kidding. Like, they, they actually think this is amazing. And, like, I, I'm like, no. So this good. Is, this is really, really not good. Like, um, so I wrote, I wrote an article. I, I even called it yeah. a rant article about this. But, like, uh, it goes into a lot of detail on mint openings and why most of them are bad. It outlines some of the good ones and then some of the better ones that are still bad. So I, I kind of want to skim the surface. I kind of want to skim the surface of that article here. But, uh, you know, if you want more detail, we'll put a link to the article in the description of this video. Mint openings definitely have some discussions surrounding them and i do want to and adam wrote a whole article again about it which you should definitely check out to get a better understanding of it the other thing that i would direct you to is the fact that when we were talking last time about tempo to illustrate what the worst possible thing you could do to your deck was <laughs> we talked about opening mint i just want to if you take nothing else away from this I want you to think about the fact that I was trying to think of an illustrative example of why something is bad. So I needed the worst possible thing, and I chose opening mint. Shout out to opening donate and trashing all your cards, but <laughs> um, like I don't know how much more clear I can make it to you that it's terrible. Yeah, so like it's got a lot of issues. Um, yeah. First of all. Um, if there's like any junking at all, you can just—I mean, <laughs> just forget it. Like you, you're, you're dead. 
you you lose five coppers, and now you have four bad cards in your deck. And let's say you open something amazing with your two dollar card. Like you have one good card in your deck. The mint is not good yet. You have three estates yeah. and you have two coppers. Like that's your deck. That's a really bad deck. What yeah. are you gonna do with that? And we talked a little bit already about opening about buying mint too early can leave your deck with a really bad ratio of money to dead cards and opening with it and, and adam talked about junking you want to think already you've been junked three times by having the estates like opening mint leaves you with a terrible ratio of dead cards to live cards yeah and the the mint is dead for several turns too so it's like you've got four junks there's there's one last thing with mint like if you have a five two opening so much of the time there's other five dollar cards that are going to be much better for you if you open with that other five dollar card and just play for a later mint using the fundamentals like we've been talking about uh you know getting yeah. the draw on the estate trashing like upgrade is just so good you can trash your estates and gain silvers or cantrips or something and you're going to be so much better off playing for a later mint in that case. Yeah, and a deck that has mint and upgrade both in it is really good because then you can upgrade the mint into a gold <laughs> or a goons or whatever. And <laughs> that's you really don't that's, like that mint. Well, I mean, it's a really good combo to have because the mint has helped you get really thin and the upgrades helped you get thin as well. And it's much easier to get an upgrade and then get a mint than it is to get a mint and then get yeah. an upgrade. Yeah. It's it's way easier, and that's, again, what we were... I know the term tempo is kind of overused at this point, at least by us, me in particular, and it the concept is a little nebulous, but it's really easy to illustrate with Mint. Yep. Yeah. So, like Adam said, even when you can get away with opening Mint, even when it is viable, you do need to answer the question, is it the best thing you can do? Right. You do have to compare it to, like, if there's any support that's five or more, you know, you have to compare it to opening with that other support here. So a lot of the discussion revolves around cards that are four or less. And, and even then you have to you have to think about just opening with the four costs and if that's better. So, like, yeah. there, there are two examples of cards that I think are actually good to open with, with a mint. I think the best one is Fool's Gold. Yeah. Um, you can open Mint Fool's Gold, and this is actually, if... For, for a two-card kingdom, this is the only time I would open Mint if I was just playing with Mint and the support card in a two-card kingdom. Mint Fool's Gold is actually quite good um, because all you want to do is shove Fool's Golds in the deck. So all you yeah. have to do is hit two, and that's that's actually not hard to do in a deck with two coppers and a Fool's Gold in it. Well, and the, the Mint is possibly gaining you more of those, too. Yeah, your Mint isn't a dead card either. So you have, like, four live cards out of seven, which is quite good. And again, please don't take that to mean that opening mint is really good in any other situation. There's an <laughs> exception to every rule. This is that. Mint and Fool's Gold kind of breaks the rule of being not good to open with mint. Yeah. So like the the other the other big one for me is page. And you know, yeah. I wouldn't be going with this. I wouldn't be going for it without some other support, like unless the champion's actually good. But uh, the reason mint and page is good is just because uh, in page games, usually success is just defined by playing your travelers quickly and getting the champion ASAP. And the mint helps you do that. And, and the fact that champion is so busted just kind of outweighs the fact that you're not doing much. I mean, yeah. you're playing a treasure hunter, which gains you silvers, which is good for the deck. You're playing a hero, yeah. which gains you something else that's good. And that's also good for the deck. And then you get a champion, and then you probably have bought some other stuff. And usually that means your head because champion is busted. Yeah, it definitely can be the defining card on most kingdoms where you see it. Right. Not a champion. R right, yeah. Uh, I, I should add that like I've played well over 3,000 games of Dominion, and never have I opened Mint and not regretted it. <laughs> to put that out there. Like I've never, I've never uh, gotten the chance it... to open Mint Fool's Gold or Mint Page. It's never actually happened so, to me. I have opened Mint before... And I didn't immediately say I'm being punished for this terrible opener, yeah. but I, I did question whether it was the best thing. The support in my mind that I 
justified the mint buy with was actually embargo. And here is my thinking behind that. I had said before, I said before that the baseline that you take into when you're looking at a heavy trasher, deciding when you've trashed too much is asking, have I taken away my deck's capability to acquire a silver? And I thought, I'm going to open Mint and thin everything, and then I'm going to play my Embargo and gain a silver, and I won't lose too much ground. How'd that go? I lost. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't really close. Um, it was actually to, to Jessica, my girlfriend, again. So, um, <laughs> Nice. Shout out. But uh, yeah. So, but, you know, there is some light synergy or justification, I'm going to call it, for getting a mint when you see something like Alms or Remake or Chapel. If you've got Lucky Coin in your deck and you don't have to trash it to the mint, if you see Squire, those aren't good, per se, necessarily, but they are ways to justify opening with mint. Sure. With alms, you're really looking for estate trashing that costs four or less. That's really what you're after. Um, with uh, Squire, uh, Squire's just bad. Uh, I don't think Squire's any good at all. I think you can compare that to Delve. Uh, you can actually get silvers. So this is actually a good comparison because this is way better than Mint Copper. And Mint Silver yeah. with Delve is still real bad, right? Um you're, how are you going to hit four? I think uh, I mathed it, and like, with you, you need to hit four with delve because you really want to be getting two silvers. Otherwise, like your right. deck is super slow. You have a twenty eight percent chance to hit four with delve, and if you don't, like it's it's actually kind of difficult to use that draw where you didn't hit four to hit four in the future. Um, so like you're you're looking at turn six or turn seven before you can hit four, and then. You know, you really want to get that estate trashing in there. It's it's not good. It's it's a lot worse than pretty much anything. Like I think it's worse than big money by a lot. Right. Yeah, Adam listed out the two big ones that strongly justify a mint opening, and these other cards like Chapel or a Silver Gainer or a two cost Silver or something, they are slight justifications for doing it. But that's not saying it's the best thing on the kingdom it's just something that makes it so that you do it and you're not totally out so i would say that's true for chapel uh chapel can thin the estates pretty fast and get you a deck of like chapel copper 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 silver by turn five even with bad draws that's pretty good the the two cost silver gainer i don't think it's good you need some way to get rid of the estates for that to be any good and that's more yeah. important. And you need to be going for that directly and have a plan to get that card if you're going to open mint. And like, without alms, eh? I mean, for, sure. for that silver gainer stuff to be good, you need some big draw and you need some reward for silver flooding also. And like, pass Phaedum, that's really tough to come by. Well, and that comes down to evaluating whether or not mint is a good card for your deck in the first place. A lot of the time, Mint being the best thing in the face of other control options and other thinning especially comes down to, is the Mint actually going to do anything for you once you have it? That's a good point. Yeah. So in summary, Mint is a really interesting and dynamic card, and it's usually something that you build to for a mid-game buy rather than open with for early game deck control. Yeah. I would uh, I would say that's that's a pretty decent summary, but man, I gotta be honest with you, like we've had a little bit of this minty lunch meat, and I feel like I feel like I want something else. Yeah, mint meat is actually infamous for leaving unsatisfied if it's the main course. Yeah, that's, you can quote me on that. And I feel like it's you know it's got my sweet tooth satisfied, but, but I'm really looking for something fresh you know fresh from the farm yeah i know what you mean yeah something that maybe costs six yeah that sounds delicious (laughs) i love six six. (laughs) 
So the other card we're going to talk about is actually Farmland. Oh, and Farmland so comes from the Hinterlands expansion, and it's a victory card. And again, it costs six. Mm. Farmland is worth two points if it's in your deck at the end of the game, and it has an on-gain effect. When you buy this, trash a card from your hand. Gain a card, and that's compulsory. Gain a card costing exactly two more than the trashed card. All right. Uh... Yeah. So I feel like I feel like in general this uh, farmland is pretty underestimated, and I think that's yeah. because when you do get benefit out of farmland, it's not this huge benefit, but like it's a marginal benefit, and so you have to find ways to squeeze the value out of it to get these marginal benefits. So it's not like this, you know, big big star of the show with the sequins and everything. It's kind of this nice thing to have that's better than not farmland in a lot of cases. It definitely is. I mean, the fact that it's worth points is kind of a big deal when you consider what it's actually doing when you buy it. Yeah, did you know that points are pretty good for winning the game? Yeah, I have actually heard that before. I typically don't go for points, but I yeah. think I should more often. Yeah, you should at least consider it, I think. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, like, um, you know, farmland itself is worth two points, but, like, there's a list of farmland plays that are somewhat standard. Like, if you have, uh, you can farmland and trash a golden gain of province. And uh, you needed $9 in your hand to do that, and you get 8 VP. So, like, yeah, that's better than a province. It makes your deck a little worse than buying province would, but, you know, that's that's good. If you had an extra dollar and a gold in your hand, you get more points. I love points. Yeah, points as the uh, tabletop channel, no put up, no pun included, always illustrates make prizes yeah then then there's like the colony analogy <laughs> points make prizes with colonies making right into me like anyway uh so like you can it's farmland podcast. <laughs> you can farmland to platinum <laughs> into a colony uh yeah so that that actually only requires 11 which is the same as buying a colony and you get 13 points uh, or a gold 13? into a province by that's in that same vein. Thirteen? What's wrong with me? You get twelve points for farm landing a platinum <laughs> into a colony. I'm I was good totally at math. just gonna let that go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, once again, that makes uh, your deck worse and actually makes it a lot worse because like um, you lost a treasure and gained you two lost a, a platinum, you know, and turned it into a card yeah. that doesn't make you money. So that's you know, it makes it a lot worse. But hey, points. Sometimes you need them. Uh, farmland is actually pretty good in cursing games. If you farmland a cursing into an estate, you get four VP for six dollars, and this actually makes your deck better. Oh, there's the same number of dead cards. I could have bought a deck tree. It's no, it's actually better. Well, we'll talk about it in a bit. Um, but even better than that for your deck is um, like farmlanding a curse into some other two cost card. So like I'm salivating and thinking about Vagrant because Vagrant would just be amazing. You got Especially three bucks. in a deck where. A deck where you're greening already, presumably, if you're buying yeah. the farmland. And you have and now you're putting it also. It's like gaining a lab at that point. <laughs> it's, it's exactly <laughs> the same as gaining a lab. It's the same thing. Yep. There's, there's no difference whatsoever. Between yeah. gaining the vagrant and yeah. gaining the lab, if you've got farmlands to draw off it. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, You could farmland <laughs> a farmland into a province. That's uh, 6 yeah. VP for $6.00. And your deck is effectively the same as if you had just bought the province. So, like, uh, you know, there's this yeah. there's this idea that farmland can kind of serve as economy in this in this vein. And, and we'll, I'm almost done. We'll get there. But the last one, which is the least useful, which is why I saved it for last, is you could farmland a silver into a duchy, which is 5 VP for $8. And it makes your deck worse. But uh, sometimes if you have to duchy dance, you know, you can do it. Or maybe you had terminal collision. You had two three dollar terminal silvers, and yeah. you know you, that's was all you could do. Maybe that, but still, this this feels pretty bad. Yeah, and a lot of these transactions that Adam's bringing up, when you get into actual games of Dominion, the value of them isn't the efficiency of cost for points. It's the fact that you can kind of screw with the math. And Adam referenced the concept of duchy dancing. If you haven't really heard that term before and there's a chance you haven't but you should definitely do some research on it because it, it, it is a pretty important concept at dominion and gameplay dominion the, and gameplay what maybe we, we, maybe we should do a podcast on that 
that might be a good episode now that you mention it. Yeah, let's do that next time. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Did we have anything important planned for next time? I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway. I don't think I've planned anything important ever in my life. But so yeah. Dominion. Yeah, back to duchy dancing and the way farmland plays into it. What it comes down to is that you're both trying to set up situations, you and your opponent, where you're not letting your opponent win on his next turn. That's why a lot of the times you don't buy the second to last province. And that's why you end up buying duchies to pad your points or some other kingdom card. Okay, so uh, I'm going to take my shirt off real quick. Oh, we're getting into theory. All right, so um, farmland is... uh, it plays roles other than points, right? And farmland can actually play an economic role in your deck. So I want to say that farmland is kind of like a silver, but it's only good for buying provinces. And this is kind of the best case, but like... So it's like harem. Uh, actually, it's not too far from harem because it, you know, is worth two points. And that <laughs> plus six other dollars in your hand can mean that you get a province. You farmland, trash the farmland, gain a province, right? And you still have the same number of points. So it's kind of like a silver that's good for, for you know, gaining a... for only good for buying provinces. So so this is the best case, right? It, well, the requ- other thing... Yes? Is that if you were going to draw two estates, then having the farmland that's worth two points is kind of like having a lab. It's kind of like gaining a lab when you gain a farmland. It's the exact same thing, yeah. <laughs> okay. So it, this requires there to be farmlands in the supply, right? If there's no farmlands left, then, you know, you can't buy a farmland to, to get the effect. And also, uh, it only works once per province, right? If I have two farmlands and four other dollars, I can't do this silver thing, right? It doesn't work. <laughs> So you don't want to go too crazy with the farmlands. And normally when you're not going too crazy with the farmlands, you don't have too many of them, then the pile's not super low. So, like, you know, this is fine in moderation, right? But you can view farmland as having this silver-like effect. So now we compare farmland to gold at the same price point. I want to buy farmland or I want to buy gold. If I can find a way to make that on-gain benefit worth more than the dollar that I'm missing out on and the wonkiness, then I can justify buying farmland over gold. And I posit, sir, whilst shirtless, that this is actually most of the time. A lot of the time, farmland is going to be a better buy than gold. Really? So why don't you give us some examples of when you think you're getting more than a dollar of value out of that trash for benefit? Okay, so if you don't have any cards in hand to trash, obviously this is not going to work. Let's say you have an estate. Right. Let's say you have an estate. <laughs> please, and please get to zero cards in hand and buy a farmland. That's no, yes. don't, don't do that. Probably not good. Okay. So you, let's say you have an estate in hand, and let's say there are no $4 cards in the supply. So you could buy a farmland and just straight up trash an estate. Okay? Okay. This is, this is better than gold. Why is that better than gold? Because trashing an estate is amazing. And now you have this card that's like a silver. So assuming that you're ready to buy provinces by the time you see that farmland, this is better than a gold. So this implies that you are already in the endgame greening phase and that you still have an estate and that you have it in your hand. Or you're you're getting ready to get into the endgame greening phase, right? Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I think you're going to have trouble hitting six with an estate in your hand if you're too early for this to be good anyway. So a lot of the situations sure. you're going to find yourself in are, are situations where the farmland is going to be this good. Yeah, and I totally understand what you're saying, and I could kind of get on the bandwagon. I would need to give it some more thought to call it better than gold nine times out of ten, but that's what playtesting is for, Sure. especially these boards we do. I, uh, I, I didn't say portion. nine times out of ten. Uh, um, you heard like it here seven, first, Adam Horton, nine times out of ten. 7.55 times out of ten. Yeah, so the <laughs> other way to think about farmland's economic impact in terms of buying provinces is also to kind of just bear in mind that provinces cost six instead of eight, provided you have a farmland in your hand, or if you have a gold in your hand that you're willing to not play. So... 
Yeah, farmlands trash for benefit can create a unique sort of economy for your deck. Sure. Uh, I, I should. I want to go back and just say, like, if there are four cost cards in the kingdom that are any good at all, that's just gravy on top of all of this stuff. So, like, yeah, you can look at it for, through the lens of, oh, I just paid six dollars to get one more point because the farmland is worth one more point in the state, and I got a four cost. I paid six dollars for a four cost card. That feels bad, but. If you view the farmland as being like a silver, then you're actually getting quite a bit of value on this. There, and there's another actual aspect of economy to farmland, and it's something that kind of overlaps with the discussion we had on rats when we did that episode. So there's a particular sort of economy that not every board of Dominion really unlocks, and it cares more about the cost of the cards in your deck than it cares about what your cards in your deck actually do rats does this in a lot of ways with trash for benefit hey toby and, yeah hey toby hashtag hey toby and farmland does a lot of the same thing so if you trash a card with farmland you've added a six cost card to your deck and you've also increased the value of one of the cards in your deck by two and that's actually quite a bit of value if you have a lot of things that care about cost, like remodel or raise or ritual. Yeah, those those trash for benefit cards, you know, they they worked well with rats. They work well with farmland too. There's there's synergy there. Only you get this on gain effect. Um, yeah. It can be pretty the, useful. It's also okay to prioritize farmland if you want to get rid of the zero cost cards in your deck and the only real situation i can think of where that matters is with chariot race if you're really <laughs> wanting to get your chariot races online the, don't be ridiculous jake winning chariot races is not a thing that happens okay <laughs> i know it says no, it's, it's possible on the card but you don't you don't win chariot no one wins chariot races jake. nobody that's impossible nobody ever does that's impossible no, i mean you don't do it, but... No one I, does it, no, Jake. Nobody does it. It's never <laughs> happened before. The world champion of Dominion can't win chariot races, and neither can you. No no one has ever won a chariot <laughs> race. It's never happened, Jake. So theoretically, it could if you prioritize thinning coppers over estates, but then you've done that, and that's bad, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah. That seems seems kind of bad. Just yeah, so race because you never win them anyway. Yeah. Right. The takeaway from that is that farmland can be sort of a shining star when you are playing a deck that cares more about the cost of cards than the effect of cards. Sure, and I, I think the analogy when you're buying farmland just to trash it and you know maybe bump up the cost of another card, like a lot of times that analogy of I just paid six for a four dollar card, like that can kind of start to feel pretty bad here. If you're just yeah. going to intend to trash the farmland. So like you want to be careful and make sure there's not just a better option at five or six that's out there without those options. You're in pretty good shape, but you know, make sure you can't do better by buying a fiver. But Hey, I mean, if, if the whole point of your deck is to do this trash for benefit shenanigans, then yeah, you're, you're probably in good shape. Yeah. The other synergy that farmland kind of has is with other trash is with other on gain effects that you are trying to put into your deck or, or gain turn by turn. Yeah, like what border I mean village. By, right, like border village. <laughs> well, no, not like border village. What, it, <laughs> what do you mean? Border village is a great example. There's good synergy there. What do you mean? How is there? You buy synergy border villages, board. and now you have all these six cost cards that you can farm land into provinces. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's not what you were thinking what were you thinking no no i was thinking about these cards that you bu are buying kind of exclusively for their on gain effect like border village or what else sorry well like <laughs> sometimes putting that extra temple into your deck you've only bought it really to get the points that were on the pile but oh, now you have this temple like in your deck and what i mean by that is or ill-gotten gains if there's a seven cost out a lot of the time like. you pick up these <laughs> on gain cards and understand that they're over-costed for what the card actually does, or the card is actually bad, but you've picked it up in order to get that on-gain effect. Yeah, like Skulk. Or Mint. Or Mint. 
Okay, so sure. Mint. If, if you have the ability to farmland that into something better, like, I would like to turn my mint into a king's court. That sounds pretty good. But I also get the benefit of having trashed all the coppers with mint. So if you see farmland with other trash for benefits, maybe the wheels should start turning in your head about how you can make that work for you. And then I king's court of farmland. <laughs> yep. Uh, I King's would say, <laughs> yeah, I would say probably the strongest synergies here, like for farmland for that kind of purpose. Like you mentioned, ritual. Uh, I think governor is also pretty good for that. Yeah, governor likes yeah, trashing definitely. the farmlands. You can use that on gain to to transform a silver into a governor if you want to, or just whatever else you feel like. Yeah. No, that's a great use of farmland as well. Yeah. Hashtag good times. There we go. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like I've gotten my fix in of uh, lunch meat here. Yeah, we've had two different kinds of meat at this point. We've had six cost lunch meat and we've had mint lunch meat. So, yeah. So I'm feeling pretty good, but uh, I mean, it would be easier to eat this if I had another piece of bread on the edge of the sandwich so that I could properly grip the thing. What do you think? I don't know. Have you ever had open-faced sandwiches before? Yeah, but usually they're covered in gravy. And what's the gravy going to be? Is it going to be a kingdom? Ah, uh, yes, bread gravy. Why don't, why don't we just why don't we call this an open-faced podcast sandwich and have this be the gravy? Yes, I like that idea. So, what's so going to be our gravy this time? All right, here we go. We've got Crossroads, Hamlet, Hermit, Bishop, Smithy. Mint, Swamp Hag, Farmland, Hunting Grounds, Forge, and Triumphal Arch. Once again, for our audio-only listeners, we have Crossroads, Hamlet, Hermit, Bishop, Smithy, Mint, Swamp Hag, Farmland, Hunting Grounds, Forge, and we have Triumphal Arch. All right. First thing I see is farmland and hunting grounds and just like hearts appear in front of my yeah. face. Yeah. Yeah, there's that. some serious synergy there because you have a six cost that can become a province and you have a six cost that kind of wants to be trashed near the end game. You can get 11 so, points by farmlanding hunting grounds in a province. It feels so good. I think that that point we made about farmland screwing up the, your opponent's math for end game play is <laughs> going to come true quite a bit here just because of the synergies between hunting grounds and farmland and your ability to have these huge point swings that your yeah. opponent didn't see happening. Yeah, for sure. Hunting grounds is a card that really likes to be um, trashed for provinces and uh, it's good at that because uh, it draws so many cards that you can usually have a few left over. So I feel I feel pretty good. I mean, I just like hunting grounds for that purpose, but this is not a hunting grounds podcast. Um, not yet. We, we could make it happen. Yeah. So, yeah, there's Hunt both mint and hunting grounds here. And uh, if I'm looking at uh, if I'm looking at mint, is it going to be good? Uh, well, I see I see some synergy. Bishop really likes mint. It also really likes farmland. Uh, mint can just yeah. gain stuff for you to bishop and farmland can be bishoped pretty nicely. And uh, really, the only other copper trashing is Forge. And uh, Forge just doesn't seem as good as Mint for trashing coppers, because all I have to do is draw the coppers once in Mint. But with Forge, I have to draw the coppers with the Forge, and that involves hitting seven. Hashtag feels bad, man. However, there is actually some support here for Forge, because you've got the excessive draw that a Forge hand really likes to see. So Forge might also give you some decent endgame options. You've got... The same way that farmland can trash the hunting grounds, you can trash it with forage and maybe, I don't know, in a state or a hamlet and get that province just the same. Okay, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I don't think forage is good here. Let's see. Is forage good here? It has draw. No. Well, I think forage is actually good here. Is it going to outclass farmland? Uh, I think bishop is like the whole point of this deck. I think you, you open Hermit, uh, you you thin your estates, you uh, probably get a Madman, get a Mint, and you just start bishoping expensive cards. You throw some Villages and Hunting Grounds in the deck, and you just play Bishop a whole bunch. I have to wonder if a deck that ignores Bishop 
and rushes into the trash for benefit to have these huge point swings and gain provinces and, you know, have a lot of them before your opponent can get there will outpace a deck that has decided it wants to win with bishop points. I mean, the bishop deck can play Swamp Hags, but it doesn't care about the curses all that much. It can score a billion points. I really like bishop as the centerpiece of this thing. So it doesn't care about getting the curses from Swamp Hag in terms of keeping them at the end, but it does actually care about having them mid turn wise because you have to use a terminal space and a bishop play to get rid of it that's something else you're not trashing and it's points you're not getting sure uh i think you don't have to buy that many cards in the bishop deck though because you can just mint golds and bishop them and be relatively happy you can sit there with swamp hags in play and let your opponent take all the curses while you just get a few points a turn i'm really warm on bishop here i think it i think it does everything you want Maybe. I think it's also helping your opponent who, if your opponent decides to rush with maybe crossroads, save up for a big mint buy, get some treasures into the deck, and have draw to get trash for benefit value at a farmland, you're helping your opponent speed that along with your bishop. Sure. Um... Yeah, bishop uh, helps. I certainly wouldn't open bishop. I would get bishop mid-game to minimize that effect. But uh, I still think the bishop deck's better. Well, I definitely am interested in finding out. And I'm interested in hearing what you guys would do, too. So if you want to take a look at this kingdom and let us know how you would play it out, do you think Triumphal Arch is significant? Do you think that this game is won on bishop points? Or do you think that farmland and province are going to dominate? Oh, also, uh, Crossroads Farmland Synergy. Hashtag Synergy. Hashtag Synergy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so shout at us, uh, YouTube comments section, or you can check out the forums at adamhorton.com. And go there, comment, let us know what you think about the kingdom or the episode, or tell us what you think about the uh, next episode. Uh, the whole end game episode. Or us episode. personally. Uh, yeah, especially, especially Jake. Especially... If you have compliments, yeah, are preferred. If you, yeah, if you if you have bad things to say about Jake, uh, tell Adam privately. I mean, you're wrong, I guess, <laughs> but sure. <laughs> no, yeah, make sure you definitely send me your hate mail. Um, yeah, for sure. That's that's gonna be something I need. Yeah, and <laughs> and also like if you have things you want to hear addressed on next episode, yeah. which is about in game play, uh, yeah, also also shout at us uh, because. I think our experience with last week's podcast and uh, the delay that that yeah. did happen by a day, it ended up having this uh, situation where we were re-recording the podcast. We had feedback, and it was useful, and so we want to give that a shot. Uh, let us know what you want to hear, especially because endgame play is kind of a topic that's big and probably won't be contained in one episode. So uh, yeah. a little bit of direction for what you guys want to hear might be useful in this case. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into this when we get to that episode. But of course, we're going to give as much of endgame play as we feel can be contained in that one episode. And with the understanding that we might come back to it at some point if we get enough. So if you have content that you want to hear about, definitely feel encouraged to bring that up so we can get it in this episode. Yeah, you said can be contained, and all I could think about was that old school Miley Cyrus song, Can't Be Tamed. Oh, nice. You know, I'm not a Are trick. I'm not a trick you play. I'm wired a different way. Okay. Are not we going to do a fade out to that? I'm not Are a we... fake. It's set in my DNA. Wow. You're really taking me there. I don't think I've actually heard that song. Uh, it's It's okay. It's a lot better than anything from Bangers. What's Bangers? It's her second most recent album that was complete garbage, except for Wrecking Ball, as long as you didn't watch the music video. Oh, you liked Wrecking Ball? The song. The music video made me extremely uncomfortable, but the song was great. But, like, it was kind of like the middle finger of that album, because it's like, yes, I still have talent. I'm just choosing not to use it. (laughs) Oh, man. You know a lot more about Miley Cyrus than I do. Yeah, she broke my heart. Kind of like T-Swift is breaking my heart with reputation. But I is don't know. Is that her it's new too album? Soon. 
Yeah, it's it's too soon though. I don't want to talk about it. The wounds Aww. are still fresh. <laughs> Hashtag, please come back. T Swift, please. Uh, Adam is devastated. Yeah, I was listening to Pandora, and and a song from Red came on. That's T Swift's uh, next most re- recent album. It came on that I hadn't heard before, and I'm like, oh, I remember, I remember back when I liked T Swift's music. Mm. Uh, it was it was tough for me, but I got through it. It was a good song. Sounds good. Anyway, uh, thanks for listening. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you for listening. Yeah, if you have, uh, if you came here for the Dominion talk and you've been listening to the last, like, two minutes, I guess I just want to apologize. Yeah, we'll just let uh, you in on a little secret. Smithy is OP. All right. Yeah, so Smithy OP. is kind of OP. I hope yeah. they get around to nerfing yeah, uh, I'll see if I can. I'll see if I can get Donald to nerf it. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, Ben is here. Please nerf. Okay, uh, this has um, gone on for long enough. Uh, thank you for listening. <laughs> too long, you might even say. <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> I like it. It went awkward silence. <laughs> yeah, good. like sure you leave it going like through this part too yeah, i'll have the theme music <laughs> playing over us talking and then the theme yeah. music's done and we're still talking hi podcast listeners hey are you still listening to this <laughs> you should turn the podcast off <laughs> there's nothing left of any value on this podcast right we we went into everything that is going to positively impact your life and then some Oh, you know that you know that gathering card, that five dollar gathering card, wild something. What was that again? Oh yeah, wild 